Okay, Rav Oisai, let's get started. We're on Daf Yud Ches Amad Aleph, Gufa, the fifth line. Just to review something that we saw yesterday, Omar Rava, Zor She'ochal Min Ha'ola Lefnei Zrika Chutz Lechom, Ala Rabbi Shimon Loke Chamesh, that we had seen that a person can commit one act and be liable for multiple sets of malkus. And in this case, this is a person who's not a Kohen, who eats the flesh of a carbon ola, which is normally supposed to be completely burnt, and he eats it outside the city of Yerushalayim before the blood of the carbon ola has been sprinkled. So as we learned yesterday, he violates five lavin. He gets five sets of malchus. Number one, because he's a zor, he's a non-kohen who's eating kadshim. Number two, he's eating the flesh of an ola. The Torah says it has to be completely burnt and you're not allowed to eat it. Number three... He's eating it before Zrika Saddam, before the blood is sprinkled, and you're not allowed to eat from sacrificial meat until the atonement of the sprinkling takes place. Numbers four and five is that he's eating it, A, outside of Yerushalayim and outside of the temple. So <clears throat> those are things that you can't do with Kadshe Kadshim, such as an Ola, the higher form of Kadshim. So he's, he's committed five offenses, five sets of Malkas. So the Gemara now asks, "Vililki nami mishum vizar lo yochal ki kodeshem," but there's an- another mitzvah lo say in the Torah besides all of that we saw yesterday, which is the Torah says uh, that only the kohanim may eat the sacrificial meat, but a zor, a non-kohen, lo yochal ki kodeshem may not eat because the the meat is holy. So why don't you add that and say he gets a sixth malchus? Gemara says, "Hani mili hecha de la kohanim chazi, hacha de la kohanim nami la nami lo chazi." So the answer is because that whole pasuk prohibiting a czar from eating sacrificial meat is prohibiting from eating meat that kohanim are permitted to eat, but uh, the meat of a korban ola is not even permitted to kohanim, and therefore he does not fall under the restriction of that pasuk. So nasar. But there's another Pasuk. Now this Pasuk is talking about eating trefa meat, meat that's torn and has not been properly shechted. But Chazal pick up on the extra word basade in the Pasuk. It says, Uvasar basade terefa. Do not eat meat that has been torn in the field. Now who cares where it's torn? Why does the Torah have to tell me that it's in the field? It doesn't have to be in the field. So we learn from that, from that extra word, basada, that any time meat that is supposed to be confined to one place is displaced to somewhere where it's not supposed to be eaten, it becomes prohibited and is under this prohibition of lo sochelu. You may not eat it. So carbon ola meat, which is supposed to be confined to the temple and is taken outside, should fall under this Isser as well, and it should be a second, uh, another Malkus. So the Gemara answers, Hani mili hecha de bifnim chazi, hacha de bifnim nami lo chazi. The Gemara answers because that, that Pasuk only addresses a situation where the meat, when it's kept in its confines, is, can be eaten. But this meat, even when it's kept in its confines, cannot be eaten, and therefore it's not under this Pasuk. Vilil ki nami kidder Rebbe Eliezer. The Amar Rebbe Eliezer, lo ye achel, Ki Kodesh Hu. Now, this Pasuk is refer- referring to the law of Nosar. What is Nosar? When you have meat that you're permitted to eat from a carbon, there's a certain expiration date. If you don't eat it by the expiration date, it becomes Nosar. It's forbidden to eat, and you get Misa Bidei Shamaim if you eat Nosar. Now, why don't we argue like this? That the Kol Sheba Kodesh Pasuk, Chazal learned from that Pasuk that it's not only referring to Nosar, but it's referring to anything that is holy that becomes no longer fit to eat is under the prohibition of Lo Ye Ochel Ki Kodeshu. Mm. Something that was Kodesh and became Pasuk cannot be eaten. So why doesn't this apply to this guy who's eating from the Korban Ola? So the Gemara gives a similar answer. Hani mi li hecha dekoidem pisulo chazi. Hacha dekoidem pisulo nami lo chazi. The answer is, is because that Pasuk is only prohibiting something that at one time was permitted. Before the expiry date. Before the expiry. 
right? But over here, it was never permitted, and therefore, it's not under this pasuk either. So, if you eat all the meat, there's no punishment. <clears throat> No, there is. It's just that we just saw this guy's getting five sets of malchus. So it's one of those. But the Gemara is asking, why not give him another one based on these psukim? In other words, it's not a question of not giving him malchus at all. It's giving him an additional malchus. So I mean, so what's the what, what's the punishment for eating all of me? What's the what do you love? What's the love you're over? So, the Gemara had said yesterday that it's based on a pasuk that we saw, uh, where the Torah says, "Lo suchal leechol bisharecha." You may not eat in your gates. And then the Torah had listed a number of different examples. Based on a b'risa that we saw yesterday from Rabbi Shimon, the Gemara had said that the word um, uh, um, uh, nidarecha in that pasuk is referring to eating the meat of an ola sacrifice. And for that you get malchus because it says lo sucha lechol bisharecha. So he's getting it already. He's getting it anyway. The question is, give him another one. So this is important. So the Gemara now says, Okay, fine. So we're not going to give him Malchus for that, but there's another Bryce that quotes Rabbi Eliezer for which he should get another Malchus. The Torah says, um, when it comes to the consumption, here the Torah is talking about <coughs> burning the mincha that even a Kohen is not permitted to eat. The Torah says, Kalil lo se achel. It must be completely burnt and it may not be eaten. So this teaches me that when something is not permitted to be eaten, any kind of sacrificial item that's not permitted to be eaten, it's prohibited and you get a you incur a mitzvah losa, say if you do eat it. Mm. So therefore our question is Based on that pasuk, he should get another set of malchus. So the Gemara says, "In Hachinami, the Rava mehai kra ka'omar." You're right, and Rava derives it from this pasuk. So you, this needs to be explained a little bit because it's it's a little bit unclear. And just to go back to yesterday's daf, Rava was the one who had commented on the brisa that we saw yesterday, which I just quoted to Shloimi, mm. as to how I know that if a person eats the meat of an ola, mm. he gets malchus. Mm. Rava had said, I love Rebbe Shimon, and if you're going to have a baby, you should pray that you have a baby like Rebbe Shimon. But there's a pircha, there, the, the brisa that Rebbe Shimon presented is riddled with logical flaws. Mm. And so basically what Rava is, what the Gemara is suggesting now is, Rava has great respect for that brisa, but he does not use the Pusik mm-hmm. cited in that Brisa as the source text, but rather he uses this Pusik right. as the source text. And essentially, this Pusik says that any time there is an added stigma or prohibition to sacrificial items, you get Malchus. And essentially, that's all Rav is saying. There are five stigmas on this type of meat, piece of meat that's from an Ola sacrifice before the Zrika for a non Kohen. Uh, and it's outside of the city of Yerushalayim and outside the temple, so therefore you get five sets of malchus, but it's all derived from this pasuk. Rabbi, Ola make only evening time, right? No. Only evening time during Ola. No, an Ola is supposed only to... night. No, no, slicha, slicha. An Ola, you, you can only bring karbanot during the day. But, but uh, put on a, on a mizbeach only night time. No, no. You put it on the mizbeach during the day, and you burn it but it's supposed to continue burning through the night. But, but uh, uh, um, I forget the language of the Pasuk, right? The Pasuk says that it shall burn through the night. doesn't mean that you, you place it on the Mizbeach at night. You put it on the Mizbeach during the day, mm-hmm. and it continues burning until the morning. Ah. Ad Boker, until the morning. Could be notar in Ola. Notarim could be in Ola. There's, no, notar by definition is something that you eat. It's something that no, you're that supposed to... left for tomorrow. No, no, no. But no, uh, ola is not... So, an ola, none of it is supposed to be eaten. Right. So that you can't have notar by, uh-huh, by an ola. Uh-huh. Okay? Right, right, right. Okay. So now the Gemara says, Amar of Gidol, Amar Rav, Kohen she'achal mechatas v'ashem lifnei zrika loke. If a Kohen goes ahead... Now, a Kohen is permitted to eat the meat of a, of a chatas and an asham. 
and not not a not a czar, but a Kohen is allowed to eat it. But if he eats it before the zrika, before the atoning uh, 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 action has been done to 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 throw the blood on the mizbeach, he gets malchus. And how do I know this? My taima do amakra v'achalu osam asher kupar bohem laachar kapora in lifnei kapora lo lav habo michlala say lavu. And I know this because the Torah says that the kohanim shall eat that which was used for atonement. Now, if the Torah says that the Kohanim will eat that which was used for atonement, it means that if they eat it, the, by inference we infer that if they eat it before the atonement was achieved, then they are in violation. And basically what we're saying is that you can infer a mitzvah's lo sase from a mitzvah's ase and get malchus by inference, which is an astounding thing to say. So we're going to see the Gemara is going to reject this in a moment. You never give malchus to someone based on a mitzvah's ase that infers a mitzvah's lo sase. But that's the havamin of the Gemara over here. So masiv rava v'chol behema mafresis parsa v'shosa ashes l'shnei ferosos ma'alas ge rabba behema osa t'chelu. So rava says, that doesn't make any sense. There's a pasuk in the Torah that says that any animal that has um, split hooves and chews its cud you're permitted to eat. So we can make an inference yes. from that Pasuk alone. Osa tochelu ve'en behema acheres tochelu, which implies that any animal that doesn't have those two signs, you cannot eat. You don't need the so losa. You don't need the losa. Ve'iki amart eze loso chelu lamali. That's exactly, you got it right, Shlami. So, so according to your argument that you can always infer a losa say from an ase, why then does the Torah have to explicitly state the lo sase in order to give you malchus? So, ela i itmar hachi itmar. So, you're, we, that, what that statement was made in error, and we have to correct it. If anything was stated, it was stated as follows. Omar of Gidel Omar Rav, Zar sha'achal mechatas va'ashom lefnei zrika pater. That if a non kohen eats from the chatas and asham meat of a korban that did not yet have zrika, even though normally a czar who eats sacrificial meat gets malchus, but in this situation, since he ate from the meat before the atonement was accomplished, he doesn't get malchus. My taima do omar kra ve'achalu osam asher kupar bahem, kolhecha de karinan bey ve'achalu osam asher kupar bahem, karinan bey ve'zar lo yochal kodesh. Ve'cholhecha de lo karinan bey ve'achalu osam asher kupar bahem, lo karinan bey ve'zar lo yochal. The answer is like this. We have two psukim back to back. It says, only the kohanim may eat the sacrificial meat which is used for atoning. Okay? And then right afterwards it says, but a non-kohen may not eat that aforementioned meat. So since the aforementioned meat was meat that has already uh, had its atonement performed, meaning the zrika sadam was already accomplished, that's the type of meat that the Torah is addressing when it says only the Kohanim shall eat it, but a Zor shall not eat it. A non-Kohen shall not eat it. So therefore, the prohibition that says that a non-Kohen shall not eat it is only referring to sacrificial meat that had its atonement performed. So if he eats the meat before the atonement was performed, before the sprinkling of the blood, so then he's not in violation of that specific mitzvah slosase, and therefore he will not get malchus. Amar Rabbi Lazar, Amar Rabbi Hoshia, Bikurim Hanacha Me'akeves Bahen Kriya Ein Me'akeves Ben. So now we go back to our topic that we began with yesterday when we saw the Mishnah. Remember, the Mishnah had told us that if a Kohen eats the first fruits, eats the Bikurim, before the farmer makes his recital by saying Arami Oved Avi, etc., then the Kohen gets lashes because the Torah prohibits him from eating the Bikurim before that pivotal moment of his sanctifying the first fruits. And according to our Mishnah, which the Gemara had said yesterday goes according to Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Shimon, the first fruits are sanctified only after his recital, but not before. But we saw that this was a machlokis. There's another Tana who says that the pivotal issue is not the recital, the pivotal issue is what's done after the recital when he takes the basket of fruit and vihinachto and places it down on the floor of the temple. Okay? That's called hanacha. 
So Kriya is the recital, Hanacha is the placing down of the basket on the floor of the temple. So according to Rabbi Elazar, who's the Amora in the name of Rabbi Hoshia, he sides with the Tanoim that are not like our Mishnah, and he says that the pivotal issue is the placing down of the basket and not the Kriya. And therefore, if for whatever reason a farmer did not do his recital, the Bikurim are still sanctified and they're permitted for a Kohen to eat. As long as he put them down. As long as he puts them down. What's the proper order? First, the Kriya. We had, Mend- we had Mendel read the Pasuk for us yesterday. And then put it down. First, he does the recital, and then he places it down. Umi Amar Rebbe Lazar Hachi. V'ha Amar Rebbe Lazar Amar Rebbe Hoshia. Hifrish Bikurim Kodem Lachag. Let me just let me say, let me just let me make sure. Right, okay. So, Umi Amar Rebbe Lazar Hachi. So, since when did Rebbe Lazar say this? Actually, I have to just point out that it's not so Pasha. Uh, Bill, if you could just give me a, a chumash for just a second. I just want to clarify something. The word hanacha is stated twice in the parsha of Bikurim. And, uh... So you know which hanacha we're talking about? It says, at, before the recital... It says before the recital, "Vilakacha kohen hatena miyadecha, v'hinicho lifnei mizbach Hashem elokecha." The kohen shall take the basket from your hands and place it down in front of the altar of Hashem your God. And then it says, "V'anisa v'omarta," you shall respond and say and do the whole recital. And then afterwards, "V'hinachto lifnei Hashem elokecha," he shall place it down in front of the Lord your God, and you shall bow down to the Lord your God. He must pick it up so, for the recital. It could be. It's not clear. So the Gemara today will not deal with that issue, what the sequence is, but the Gemara will deal with what is the pivotal thing that sanctifies the Bikurim. Mm. So according to Rebbe Lazar, it's the placing down, not the recital. According to our Mishnah, it was the recital and not the placing down. Doesn't it pick it up to wave it afterwards? That's we didn't. Where do you see waving? All right, it says later. Though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what are you doing looking ahead? <laughs> to, hold on a second. He's excited. Okay, so wait. So hold on a second, Mark. Okay. Umi Amar Rebbe Lazar Hachi. So since when could Rebbe Lazar say that the pivotal issue is the placing down? The Amar Rebbe Lazar Amar Rebbe Hoshia Hifrish Bikurim Kodim Lachag Vaover Alein Hachag Yer Kavu My Lav Mishum Delo Matzi Lemikri Alein. So, he, he, you know, Rebbe Lazar was quoted in the name of Rebbe Hosh, uh, quoting Rebbe Hoshi mm-hmm. again, saying that if a person, uh, you know, there's only a limited amount of time that you have to bring Bikurim. You start on Shavuos, the Bikurim time is Shavuos, and if you didn't bring it on Shavuos, you have all the way until Sukkot to bring the Bikurim. And the reason why you can't go past Sukkot, it's not clear why, but the but it, what Rebbe Lazar says is is that if you set us if the farmers set aside the fruits, but didn't get to bring them into the temple until after Sukkot, the fruit is no longer edible, and it has to rot. You can't do anything with it. So the question is, why is that? The assumption is is because the recital can no longer be performed. Why? Because part of the recital is is that I'm bringing these fruits that I've just harvested. And if it's already after Sukkot, it's no longer part of the harvest season. And that's the reason why the recital can no longer be said. And if your argument is that the recital is unimportant, or it's not crucial, so then why, is, why does that invalidate the Bikurim? Let a guy just bring it without the recital, and it's still kosher. So the Gemara answers the classic answer of Kedur Rebbe Zera. The Amar Rebbe Zera, Karol Aroi Labila in Bila Me'akeves Bo, the Cholshen Aroi Labila Bila Me'akeves Bo. So this is a, a Shas answer. It appears in many places in Shas, and the exemplar is Menachos, which which basically says that there may be a component of a mitzvah which is not crucial, but it has to be possible in order for the mitzvah to be kosher. In other words. Uh, there may be many components of the performance of a mitzvah. Some of them are crucial, and some of them are non-crucial. But even the ones that are non-crucial, there has to be the possibility of doing it, and if it's not even possible to do it, 
So then the lack of the performance of that mitzvah, invali- or that action invalidates the mitzvah. So as it pertains to Bikurim, it w- would work like this. If a person has the ability to do the recital but neglects to do so, yeah, okay. the Bikurim are still kosher because Hanacha is the, is the, is the crucial issue. Yeah. But he has to be able to do the Kriya. If he's not able to do the Kriya because it's past the date of harvest, so then, so then the mitzvah is invalid. The, primary, the example that Reb Zeyer gives for this is Kolaroi Labila, Ein Bila Me'akeves. The Torah says that when you bring a mincha, sacrifice, you're supposed to mix the flour and the oil yeah. to make a homogenous mixture. Bidiyevit, if you did not make a homogenous mixture, the mincha is still kosher, if you didn't mix it properly. However, it has to be capable of being mixed. If, let's say, the container that you have is so large that based upon, and you didn't, they didn't have industrial electric mixers back then, based on hand mixing, it's simply not possible to create a homogenous mixture because of the huge size of the oil and the flour, so then it's not a kosher mincha, even though normally homogenous mixing is not normally uh, a, a, a crucial issue, right? So that the same thing would be true over here. So it's not a contradiction. As long as you're capable of doing the kriya, then kriya is not crucial. But if you're not capable of doing kriya, then even kriya is crucial. So the Gemara now says, Rabbi Acha bar Yaakov Masi Loki the Rabbi Asi Omer Rabbi Yochanan Bekashalei the Rabbi Yochanan Ad Rabbi Yochanan. All, up until now, we've quoted Rabbi Lazar in the name of Rabbi Hoshia as the author of this statement that the only crucial act is the placing down, not the not the recital. But Rabbi Acha had cited it in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, and therefore this creates a, a contradiction in Rabbi Yochanan because Umi Omer Rabbi Yochanan Bikurim Hanacha Miakeves Ben Kriya Ein Miakeves Ben. How could Rabbi Yochanan say that the recital is non-crucial and only the placing down is crucial? Vahabamine Rabbi Asi Mir Rabbi Yochanan Bikurim Meima Sai Mutarim LeKohanim. The question was asked of Rabbi Yochanan: When, at what point? Are the Kohanim permitted to eat the Bikurim? What time, at what point do they become sanctified for the Kohen? So Rabbi Yochanan responded as follows. If they, the, the fruits were brought before Sukkot, so then the recital is the thing, is the, is the pivotal moment that makes them edible to the Kohanim. If he brought them already after Sukkot, in which case the recital can no longer be stated, Rabbi Yochanan disagrees with the aforementioned, and he says it's still kosher, but at least they just have to be brought inside the temple. So this is a big problem. It's a kasha kriya kriya kasha hanacha hanacha. So you have a double contradiction over here. In other words, Rabbi Yochanan is problematic doubly. On, over here, he says that the crucial, pivotal moment is the Kriya, yeah. whereas before, we just quoted him as saying that Kriya is not Ma'akev. And he also says that if you're not going to do Kriya, because you're not capable of doing Kriya, just bring it inside the temple. He doesn't say anything about putting it down. So you see that putting it down is not crucial at all for him. So it's a contradiction of recital on recital and a contradiction of placing it down on placing it down. Yeah. So Kriya, Kriya, Lokasha, Ha Rebbe Shimon, Ha Rabbanan. So the Gemara first says, we'll remember. Yesterday we saw our Mishnah goes like Reb Shimon, who says that the recital is crucial. And Rabbi Yo- that's who Rabbi Yochanan is citing over there. But in the other place where he says that Kriya is not Ma'akev, he's going according to the Chachamim who say that recital is non-crucial. And Hanacha Ahanacha Nami Lokasha HaRab Yehuda VaHarabanan. And why Rabbi Yochanan says in one place that Hanacha is crucial, and over here he doesn't have any place any importance on Hanacha, also is not a contradiction. He, in, he's going according to Rebbe Yehuda in one place and the Chachamim in another place. Again, at Machlok is Tanoi. So my Rebbe Yehuda, which Rebbe Yehuda are you citing? The Tanya, Rebbe Yehuda Omer, Vihinachto zu Tanufa. So, okay, so this goes back to what the Pasuk that we saw before. In the Parsha of Bikurim, in Parsha's Kitavo, the verb, place it down, is mentioned twice. Once before the recital, and once after the recital. Rabbi Huda is bothered. Why does it have to say, place it down twice? So, l- let me be very clear. It would make very good sense to th- say it twice if you hold that placing it down, that Hanacha is ma'akev, is crucial. 
Therefore, the reason why the Torah says it twice is for reinforcement that if it's not done, then the Bikurim are no good. You haven't fulfilled the mitzvah. But Rabbi Yehuda doesn't hold that way. Rabbi Yehuda says the Torah doesn't need to say it twice because I hold that Hanacha is not Ma'akev. It's not crucial. So why does the Torah write Hanacha a second time? Because the word Hanacha can be translated in two ways. It can either be translated as place it down, or it can be translated as move it. Like the words, like Rashi quotes, when, the, when Hashem in Parshas B'Shalach takes the Jews out of Egypt, it says, V'lo nacham elokim derech eretz plishtim, that God did not move them or guide them by the Philistine territory. Same verbal structure, same verbal uh, root, nacham or hanacha. So the word v'hinachto, the second time, does not refer to placing it down, but refers to moving it or waving it. That's what v'hinachto means, the second time. So ata omer zutanu fa'o'eno ela hanacha mamish. Kishu omer v'hinicho hare hanacha amur. And Rabbi Huda says, and I'll prove it to you, because the verb v'hini um, cho uh, is already mentioned at the beginning. So why does it have to say it a second time? It's coming to teach you that you have to wave it, in addition to putting it down. And how do we know that there's a Tana who argues with Rabbi Yehuda? Um, because it's, we have this b'risa with Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. What does it say? The Tanya, kohen hatenem that the kohen shall take the basket from you, limeid al habikurim shetunin tu, tenufa divrei Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. See, Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov also agrees that there has to be a waving of the bikurim, but he doesn't learn it from the word vihinachto. He says that second word vihinachto is to teach me that you must put it down because putting it down yeah. is crucial. Mm. He learns it from another source, which says, kohen aten The kohen shall take the basket from your hand. After now, what is the word? The what does the word your hand mean? Before the mirror, after the mirror. No, it says, it, this is at the very beginning. Okay, before very the beginning, mirror. before you do anything. <laughs> the kohen shall take the basket from your hand. Nothing. Now, what is the word hand doing over there? Why is that crucial? Why can't it, why can't it just say the lakacha kohen es hatena? Let the coin just take the basket. Why from your hand? So as you'll see in just a second, my time at the Rebbe Eliezer ben Yaakov, asya yad yad mishlomim, to make a gzeira shavit to the law of carbon shlomim, where we know that the animal has to be waved. Ksiv hacha the lakacha kohen hatena miyodecha, uchesiv yadov tiviena es ishei Hashem. Makan kohen, aflahalen kohen. That's to tell you that the hand that is mentioned by Bikurim has to be in some way connected to the hands mm. that are mentioned by the waving of the carbon shlamim. They do it together, right? Now hold on a second. Mm. The hand that's mentioned by Bikurim is the hand of the farmer, the bringer. Mm -hmm. The hands that are mentioned by the shlamim mm. is the Kohen oh. waving the animal. <laughs> but the Torah is connecting the two together to tell you that their hands have to be together mm -hmm. at the time of waving of both Bikurim and Shlomim. So, Haket said, how do you do it? Meniach kohen yadav tachas yad ba'olim umenif. What you do is you hold the, either the animal or the basket of fruits underneath. The farmer holds his hands underneath the basket. And the Kohen places his hands underneath the hands of the farmer, yeah. and they wave it together in all six directions mm -hmm. in that way. That's, what, that's how we make the connection between the Yad of Bikurim and the Yadayim that is written by the Korban Shlomim. Mm -hmm. But you see that Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov learns that the word Vihinachto is placing it down a second time. Why? To tell you that the Hanacha is Ma'akev. Mm. So therefore you have a Machlokas, whether Hanacha is Ma'akev or not Ma'akev. So what I was trying to say before is that maybe the second placement is after they waved it. He puts it, it comes in, puts it down, then he says his uh, Kriya, um, and with the coin he waves it and puts it, then he put it down again the second time. It could be, that, but that, that's, that's but again, again, the protocol is mm. not defined by the Gemara. Right, right. We'd have to look in the Rambam in Hilchos Bikurim to find out what the protocol is, and I encourage you to do that by all means. But there's nothing that you can infer from the Gemara. Yeah. You just got homework, buddy. Amar Rava Bar Ada, Amar Reb Yitzchak, Bikurim Me'emasai Chayovin Aleihem. So now we're going to see a third opinion in the name of Reb Yitzchak. 
At what point do the Bikurim become sanctified such that if a non Kohen were to eat them, he would get Misa Bidei Shamayim, he would be punished for eating sanctified produce? So, Mishiru Pinei Habayis. And the answer is, as soon as they enter into the temple. Now, that's a, an opinion that we haven't seen at all. Because right. we saw an opinion that when you do the recital, we saw an opinion when you place it down. No, but we haven't that. seen an opinion that as soon as it enters, the basket enters in without being put down. So the Gemara answers, Keman, who does he go like? Ki haitana. This is a third opinion in the Brisa. The Tanya, Rebbe Eliezer, Omer, Bikurim, Miksasim, Bechutzim, Miksasim, Bifnim, Shebechutz, Harein, Hein, Kenchulin, Lechol Divreim, Shebifnim, Harein, Hein, Kehektish, Lechol Divreim. And it says like this, and when you bring a basket, you've got a big, broad, wide basket of fruits, and you're on your way into the temple, and you're standing on the threshold, and you've got half the basket outside and half the oh. basket inside. So Rabbi Eliezer says, if we do a freeze frame right there, then the, the fruits that are still outside of the threshold have not been sanctified, and the fruits that are inside have been sanctified. So you see that this is a third opinion, that it's not dependent upon Kriya, it's not dependent upon Hanacha, but rather it's dependent upon entering into the Beis HaMikdash. Have a wonderful day.